I, I grew up in an evangelical church in Southern Baptist churches uh, across the South. I mean, we'd go to church two or three nights a week. And when I tell people that, they're like, oh, my God, that's over. No, we liked it. All my friends were there. And it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a great upbringing, a great foundation. But all these years later, like you, I, I look around. I don't recognize so much. But you, you said something. You, you, you picked three things out yeah. that have always made me curious. One is that within our communities, your community and my community, there's always been this sense of victimhood. Uh, there's been this inferiority complex. Uh, and uh, there's been, uh, you talk about a narrative of national restoration that comes out of the reaction to the 1960s. But I never understood the victimhood, constant victimhood. I'll just speak like evangelicals speak to each other. If you believe, then you're in on the greatest thing ever. You have the greatest story ever told. Mm. You, mm. You've been taught the greatest story, the most extraordinary story ever told. Why do you have to wallow in QAnon conspiracy theories? Mm. Like what, what, what are they compensating for? And I say they now because I don't understand People from my own tribe. What are they trying to compensate for? Why do they have to bathe themselves in lies every day about QAnon conspiracy theories, election conspiracy theories, Security. vax, on and on and on? Why? Yeah, one of the most painful things for me, I think, in 2020 was seeing certainty about uh, things that were, you know, lies and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that was, I think, I try to tell the story through my own life of growing up in a world in which we were pretty isolated from reality in a lot of ways. We were so far inside our church bubble that I think we became vulnerable to manipulation. Um, and we, we were really in that church bubble for a lot of reasons. I unpack a lot of it. Um, but we were very busy getting blessed, seeking, you know, uh, emotional experiences in church, learning how to love one another in our personal relationship, there was not a lot of focus on in the evangelical church I grew up in, or I think in evangelicalism writ large, on how to be a good public citizen. It's public character versus private character. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of fear that you've alluded to in evangelicalism. People have been telling evangelicals for decades that, you know, Christianity is on the verge of extinction. Um, and I think because of that lack of stepping out of that church bubble, uh, that mm -hmm. lack of becoming a stakeholder in the public conversation, I think there's been more vulnerability to believe that sort of thing. Yeah, but, but the, 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 the sad, the bitter irony is that the actions of the past five, six, seven years have only pushed more people away from the evangelical community. There's so there's just this constant fear of the world intruding on the church. It is actually the church and its obsession mm. with politics uh, where, mm. where people have warped. And I, I say this, and it really freaks people out that I grew up with. But, you know, there, there's like this singular obsession on abortion in most evangelical churches I go to. And when I say this, it freaks people out. Southern Baptists were pro-choice until Jerry Falwell told them in 1980 to be pro-life because it was something that could help Ronald Reagan. And suddenly, Southern Baptists who didn't care, I mean, like Southern Baptists who made fun of Catholics for being extreme on abortion, mm. suddenly this becomes the sole test of whether you're a Christian or not. And, and, and this politicalization has completely warped and twisted modern Christianity, what the evangelical church believed for, for, for decades, for a century, uh, and now they're sitting around wondering, why are people leaving our churches? Yeah, and I tell the story about how my parents were both raised in mainline religions uh, and then became saved in the Jesus movement, and my father was a, an activist against abortion. And so abortion was fundamental to our political worldview. But we thought, also thought of politics as dirty and below us and of the world. So, we, again, we didn't really engage much in politics or think about it. And 
And that meant that our entire political worldview, to the extent that we had one, was shaped through abortion. So there's that lack of investment in developing a more sophisticated, more robust uh, political way of thinking and engaging. Um, I personally think it's a failure to uh, obey Jesus's command to love God with all your mind and to love your neighbor. Yeah, and, and, and again, just because people don't want to listen when I start talking about the realities of the church and the evangelical church, I, I have a lot of great friends who are pro-life, mm. Uh, who, who see that as a center of their po po political worldview, totally get it, totally legitimate. That's what they believe, totally get it. At the right. same time, at the same time, that, that's not the center of Jesus's teachings. It wasn't even in Jesus's teaching. People usually have to grasp for Old Testament uh, scripture here or there talking about Jeremiah to justify it. And again, it's just bizarre that I guess my grandmom and my mom and my dad before 1980 weren't Christians based on Jerry Falwell's world that we now live in. Um, I, I, want to, uh, I want to also ask you, um, you, you look at a lot of the Christian nationalism, how could there be so much hatred? Uh, if you, you grew up in a, an evangelical church, I grew up in an evangelical church. I don't know what you were taught in your church. Mm. I know in mine, it was the Sermon on the Mount, it was blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, it was uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Uh, forgive, not seven times. It's all forgive, in how you treat people. forgive seventy times, seven times. Yeah. The mercy that you show other people will be the mercy that'll be shown to you by God. That moment on the cross where Jesus is being mocked by one criminal, another criminal says, don't mock him. He's done nothing wrong. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. At this very day, you will be with me in paradise. That idea that we're all sinners, we're saved by grace. It's an extraordinary faith. Why so much hatred for people who don't seem to have read the red letters in the Gospels? Well, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, hatred out there, and I don't think evangelicals are the only group guilty of it these days. Where, when we talk about Christian nationalism, though, um, I just think that there, again, has been a lack of meaningful engagement with how we apply our faith to politics. It's, a, it's a, I think, a fear-based uh, way of thinking about it. Um, and I tell the story in my book of kind of two archetypes. One would be a type of evangelical who stays away from politics, told through the story of one of my former pastors. The other is uh, another archetype, which is uh, a leader who's now a part of what's called the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, and these are people who are really trying to impose uh, their view on American politics. Um, and I just think that there has been uh, you know, this this mode of, of talking about America as the kingdom of God, which actually I've talked about on this program before, um, that confuses, uh, you know, it confuses what is what is ultimately meaningful with uh, temporal things. Of course, we care about our country, but uh, right. our faith is not invested. Uh, it doesn't rise or fall with uh, the rise or fall of America. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Eddie, Jesus, Jesus just, again, freaks people out because things have become so twisted regarding mm. the church. Mm. Jesus doesn't care about your politics. He cares about your soul, and he cares about how you treat other people. And, yeah, we're all sinners. We all mess up. Every day we mess up, but it's about forgiving and moving forward and trying to do better. And it, it's not about, hey, who's going to win the next midterm? It's just not. Oh, absolutely, Joe. I mean, look, the fact that we are sinners, the fact that we, we all are stained with original sin doesn't make us irredeemable. Actually, that admission is the condition for the possibility of being otherwise, of being saved, of, of becoming more that, that what you've been called for. But I think it's really important. Uh, that we that we that we situate John's argument or his 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 thesis right because there's a sense in which 
H. Richard Niebuhr wrote this book entitled Christ and Culture, and there's always this notion of Christ against culture, this idea that Christians, American Christians in particular, stand over and against the secularizing world, and they create this space in which they could be fully themselves in light of those who judge them because of their faith. That gets then kind of morphed, it morphs into a kind of political movement, and we have to see that in relation to the 1960s, see it in relation to the idea of desegregating schools, see it in relation to the banning of school prayer, see it in relation to the question of, of abortions. So it's all bound up in the culture wars. And we could tell the story about Paul Weyrich and others. So there's this wonderful, extraordinary, complex narrative to tell, story to tell, that actually gives John's work a kind of, impli a, how shall we say, a complex political backdrop that allows us to understand all of this. And John, John I would ask, that was, go ahead, oh, John, I'm sorry, if you want to comment on that. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, Niebuhr is actually somebody who I've begun to engage with more. I, again, this is my story of disentangling a lot of the things that I grew up with. Uh, I think one of the things that bothers more conservative evangelicals is that uh, they. I've heard that I'm too sure of myself, but what I'm critiquing actually is a certainty mm -hmm. about a lot of these things. And, and, and so I'm learning as I'm going, I'm struggling my way forward. But really my critique of evangelicalism is that uh, the building is compromised. And I've spent a large degree of the last couple of years excavating around uh, the foundations of my life and my faith, understanding how I got to where I am and understanding how evangelicalism got to where it is. And my only real invitation to conservative religious folks is not to think like me or agree with me on everything, but to engage in that same work of examining uh, the foundations and the history. Because I think a lot of times evangelicals have a tendency to think, as Jamie Smith, an author, wrote, that their views are hatched out of you know, eternity or handed down on tablets rather than being formed over time by deposits of culture and politics. Mm. So, John, I want to ask you about the question of character. I think one of the most disorienting pieces of these last seven or eight years is the way in which evangelicals have been willing to look the other way, particularly about Donald Trump. Uh, we're talking about this indictment a couple of weeks ago down in Manhattan. The question there was a man who was alleged to have paid off a porn star for an affair he had while his wife was at home with their newborn. That might have been disqualifying in the past to many evangelicals. And yet we've seen since he jumped into politics, evangelicals say, we're not electing a saint, we're electing a president. But what about all those arguments? What about all those lectures over the generations about character and humility and fellowship and kindness and all that? When did that fall away for some evangelicals? Well, I, I mean, it clearly fell away during Trump, uh, and I think that has been a, a source of a lot of uh, concern for a lot of evangelicals, um, people who grew up like me. Personally, however, I always felt like those character concerns were, were part of the problem, but didn't point to the ultimate uh, issue with Trump, which in 2016, I was emailing my family and writing uh, publicly to some degree about the ways that he showed a disregard for... Uh, our constitutional democratic structure. Um, he was encouraging, I wrote to my family, the lawless in spirit to become lawless in practice. And that would, you know, provoke counter reactions and counter reactions. And so mm. I saw, and many others saw at the time, a threat to our basic uh, social democratic order. And I think he made clear that he was serious about that in the aftermath of the 2020 election and January 6. So the critique on my part is not really about uh, personal character first and for foremost. Obviously, that bothers me. But it's really about the way that his assault on democracy and his assault on truth undercuts the common good of everyone in our country. And I think that's part of what it means, in my view, to uh, to apply uh, loving your neighbor to politics. It, it means working towards the common good of all uh, and not just for your own group. 